Ben now it's on. Oh, okay. hello. Okay. Okay, got There's a table that belongs to God. And it's a table that uh, isn't here. It's not here on earth. And it certainly isn't in hell. It's in God's house. You, you sang about his house this morning. And that table is his table. And I think of all the things that the Lord prizes, apparently there are two things. Now I'm talking about things, not people, because people, God prizes above all else. We know that that's the whole point of the cross, is even above his own life, God holds your life valuable and sacred. But when it comes to things, there's really two things that are described as being really valuable to God. One is his throne. Because his throne isn't about an ego trip based off of a human being or even a, a, a fallible kingdom. His throne makes you and I secure people knowing that he's on it and another kingdom is not. Because without God's throne, you and I have no security. We have no security whatsoever. But because he's on that throne, the scriptures describe it as being the highest place. So wherever high is, and a few of you have been high in your lifetime, but you've never been that high. It's called the highest place. And that's one of the things the Lord holds very, very dear and the other one is his table. And he describes us being at his table for the banquet. That banquet hasn't come yet, but it's coming. You sing about that this morning as well, about the spirit of God coming and about us belonging to him and being in his home. And so no matter what else is going on in 2019 in our Western worldview, you know, when you get hugged by women, you just get covered in makeup on your glasses. And I'm just now realizing either you guys are all really fuzzy or it's my eyes. It's probably both. Right? Oh, wow. Now I can see. Hello. But no matter what goes on this year, you are going to be challenged and loved and reminded to keep your eye on Jesus, the author and the finisher, meaning the one who started writing your storyline and the one who's going to finish your storyline. And there is no other kingdom and there is no other voice that can take that place. So remember those two things this year, his throne, his table. I've got a video that I want you to watch this morning. This last summer, the Lord gave me a mini series that uh, had to do with uh, the Space Hubble Telescope. How many of you have ever heard about it? In fact, if you haven't heard about it, it's almost too late because they're <laughs> building another one that they're about to deploy. It may even be finished building even as we speak. And they're going to retire uh, the Hubble, and they're going to bring out this new one. But the Hubble initially was launched in 1990, and it has had a number of repairs over the years, but they do these repairs either remotely or they go out into space. Now, one of the things I want you to think about when you think of the Hubble, it actually orbits the Earth every 97 minutes. Grasp that. Every 97 minutes, it orbits the Earth. It travels at approximately 5 miles per second in order to do so. And it's taking pictures of the Earth, and it's taking pictures out in space. But I want you to think about, when you're watching this video, there is one primary objective for the Hubble telescope, and that is for it to capture an image and then convey the image that it captures. Enjoy this video.
That's the Hubble right there. Thank you. So tech crew, if you would, go ahead and put that first PowerPoint slide up there for me, if you would. This is a picture of the Hubble. It's about the size of a large bus. So if you think of a large bus traveling through space at five miles per second, and it orbits the Earth every 97 minutes. And 97 is actually an exaggeration on the far side. It can often travel uh, the perimeter of the Earth um, in 95 minutes. So somewhere between 95 and 97 minutes, this thing rotates the Earth. And there's shows for any of you that really, really dig just way too much math. It's like they were calculating how many over a million, a million point something, how many times it's traveled the Earth um, since it was first launched. The job of the Hubble spacecraft is to collect images. So turn to somebody next to you and say, the Hubble's job is to collect images. And then it has a second job. After it captures that image, and that's actually even a better word, is to capture an image. The second thing it does is it conveys that same image. So it captures it, and then it conveys it. I want to dare to say to you this morning that as Christ followers, that is exactly our assignment. The first thing we're supposed to do is capture the image of God. Uh, God's real name, the only time that, that God was ever asked what his name is, was by a man named Moses that we're going to talk about this morning. Moses point blank asked God, what is your name? And the only time in all of recorded scripture that God was asked that, God said, my name is Yahweh. Another way he said it in English would be, I am. And another way of saying it that I just learned this last summer in school is that um, I am becoming. Not meaning that God is ever growing or that he has more to learn, but meaning that God just simply is infinite. He doesn't stop either way. He, he, if you want to think about it in geometry terms, you and I are a ray. We have a point in time where we started and we will continue for eternity. We will either continue for eternity and follow Christ, or we will continue for eternity without him. But God is a line. He has no beginning and no end. So he looks at everything all at the same time. And our assignment is, as best we can, is we take this book called the Word of God, these 66 love letters written to us, and we're supposed to take and capture an image of God. All of the aesthetics that are in this room are, helped, are to help you capture an image. Why do the lights go down low? Is it more spiritual to worship with the lights down low? Is it? No. Why would we have the lights down low in a worship gathering? Is it because we're trying to be creepy and create a lounge atmosphere, right? You know? No. It's because it helps you and I stop the busyness of everyday life and slow down a little bit, and stop and ponder. It helps us imagine. Did you know that sometimes the best thing you can do to imagine something is to close your eyes? Just close your eyes. Lori and I, uh, when we first were married, we're married now for 32 and a half years. Yeah, thank you. In fact, right here on this platform, um, I re-proposed to her um, and uh, Pastor Larry Knapp officiated uh, the ceremonies. And also, it was on a Sunday morning where I surprised her, Tiffany, just like your hubby did today. Kudos to that. You got good brownie points off of that, bud. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, right up here, and I had Lori come and sit up here, and all I told her before that morning was that I was going to uh, include her in an illustration that I was going to tell. She had no idea that I had a second ring for her. And uh, way more expensive than the first one. Trust me, fellas. <laughs> so if you didn't start out well with that first ring, you got 25 years to get another one. <laughs> and 25 years later, 
I rededic we rededicated our marriage to uh, each other up here, and it was so fun. But what you're doing is, again, you're capturing an image. If you have a wedding ring on, the whole point of that wedding ring is to capture an image. If you did your hair, if you colored your hair, and those of us who have no hair <laughs> are jealous of you who can color your hair. I can color my head, but then it's like an Easter egg, you know? But you're trying to capture an image. If you're wearing Dallas Cowboys jerseys, hoorah, you're trying to capture an image of the best sports team ever created, right? <laughs> Why do we have televisions? We're trying to help capture an image. Why? Because God is so big and so vast that he has all of these scattered handfuls of galaxies out there, and it still only captures small portions of who he is and what he is about. And we get so befuddled in the middle of that, we think, well, he wouldn't create all that and just have one inhabited. And my answer to that is, who are we to say what he should do? When did he invite us to the creation table and say, you know, I don't really know what to do with my creation, Kitty. Why don't you tell me? <laughs> Projecting an image. So thinking about images, capture that. That you and I are really a Hubble telescope that God has sent out from home base, from heaven. And our assignment is to capture the image of God and then turn around and give that image away. It is not your and I assignment to give away a different image. It's why in Scripture it challenges anyone who is in leadership to hold high ethical standard and scriptural balances. We don't get to take shortcuts on God's word as leaders and say, you know, God's word says that you need to have sexual purity, but you know what? We just want to be cool here. So we're going to alter those and reduce those down. We don't get to capture one image and then change the image and say, this is the image of God. We have to portray the same image. So if this Hubble telescope took a picture of something that God had created and then gave us a different picture, what do you do with that telescope? You fix it. Or throw it away, right? Or just, you know, cut the sucker loose because it'll go whatever it wants to in space, right? So real quickly, I'm going to only give you two minutes to do this. But in groups of two to four, I want you to talk and discuss three questions. So you're going to have to do it quick. How does one know God? How does one please God? And what lenses do you apply in your life in order to know and please God? Pick one of those three questions. Do it right now. Groups of two to four. Hit it. Okay, and tech team, if you would, go ahead and take me to slide three. It's the one that shows the aperture open. It's a big old, big old opening. The aperture door. Uh, where's Nina at? There's nobody in this room that knows more about cameras and photo taking than this woman right here. I'll guarantee you. So Nina, tell us what an aperture does. It lets light in. 
Wow, is that what you and I are supposed to do with our lives? Who's the light? John chapter 1, verse 5 gives us the instructions on that. So make note of that. I'll let you look that up on your own. That's good homework. But the aperture lets a light in. Now look at that aperture. That aperture right there is eight feet. Nina, would you like to hold a camera that had an aperture of eight feet? I would like to look through it. I don't want to see it. Right, exactly, right? Eight feet. How many of you are eight feet tall in here? Right? Right? So imagine a hole that's eight feet, and that's what it's supposed to do to suck light in for this thing so it can capture an image and then portray or convey or pass on that same image. For you and I, that would really be a picture, a physical picture of our worldview. A person's worldview is based not on being worldly. It is based on what they see. Turn to somebody and say, your worldview is based on what you see. And how you perceive what you see. And what conclusions that you draw from what you see. And then, lastly, but certainly not the least important, it decides what you do with what you see. Because we can see something and then do nothing about it. Jesus spoke to us in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, and his whole lesson plan there, people think it's about seeds. Because he talks about farmers and seeds and fields. But just last Sunday at New Hope, I asked them this question, or two Sundays ago, I asked them this question. I said, what do you, what, if you picked one word, what's the one word you think that Jesus wants us to catch in Matthew chapter 13? And I said, it starts with an L. Can anybody guess what that might be? Love. Listen. Jesus says, listen. And there's what he says. He says, depending on what kind of soil you are is really determined off of two things. Do you listen to what I'm saying? And then do you do what you listened to from me? It's the same as this Hubble image you hear. Are we going to capture what Jesus is saying to us in the culture and the society that we live in? It's so easy for us to get caught up in who's president and who's not. Who's governor and who's not. Democrat or Republican, wall or no wall. It's so easy for you and I as Christ followers today to get caught up in all of that and then be all over social media and have all of these different voices pouring into us. So where do we go in scripture and find a person that can be a hero for us? a spiritual hero, an example for us to look at their life and say, how do we know how to do this right? How do we capture the right image and then convey that image accurately to other people? How do we do that? Well, I'm going to suggest that you turn with me this morning to the book of Exodus chapter 32. Chapter 32 and chapter 33 gives you and I the story or at least part of it, of the life of Moses. Moses. Man, what a dude. Not a perfect dude. He had his flaws. Moses was a killer. He murdered, got so mad he murdered somebody, got so mad another time, he took these two-tone tablets that God had just carved with his own hand, and he threw them at people. <laughs> How many of you, I'm not, well, in this church, I shouldn't even ask that question. How many of you have ever thrown a stone tablet at somebody? <laughs> Don't ask that here. <laughs> Moses. So go with me to the golden calf image, if you guys would. Moses is going to go up the hill to hear from God, to listen to God. And when he goes up this mountain, I'm going to let you read most of this yourselves. Again, I'm going to let this be your homework this week. I'm sure that pastors Elliot and Tiffany give you homework a lot from the pulpit. We're getting some this morning. This is good homework. I'm telling you, it's, you can't get better homework than this. 
Um, I feel for you if you don't read this, not because I'm telling you to, but because Moses, we need Moses. We need his storyline. From what I learned in school, every single one of us has or should have a mentoring constellation. We just looked at a bunch of stars. Mentoring constellation, meaning you have some people that are upward mentors. Tiffany Elliott, I'm so honored for you two to consider to me to be one of your upward mentors. Upward mentor doesn't mean they're better than you. It doesn't mean they're above you. It means they're in front of you. They, they, they've been out there before you were, so to speak. Okay? And there's something in your life that they look at and say, I want some of that. And then there's plenty of other things that anybody could look at in my life and say, I don't want any of that. <laughs> but you know what? I find a lot of gratitude in that because only Jesus is the real superstar. And he's the only one in charge of the throne and the table. Okay? So in this process, Moses goes up this mountain to listen to God. And then God writes these two, stab these two tablets, and he's bringing them back down, Moses is, and he's supposed to convey, capture the image, and then convey the same image. How much uh, credibility would Moses have if he'd captured the image that God gave him, and then halfway down, he set those down and wrote his own? Or adjusted them even just a little bit, a word here, a word there. Or, you know what, we don't really need to emphasize this. Let's just, let's change that. Because that won't be real popular down the hill. And then come and give a different message. That wasn't Moses' assignment. Moses was the shuttle, the, the Hubble craft. His job was to capture image and pass it on. But here's the thing. When he got down the hill, there was a different image. The image was a calf. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were going to make a god, it sure wouldn't look like a baby cow. <laughs> and yet, here's the crazy part. They literally say when Moses left, it says they got tired of waiting for him. I thought that was only Western culture people that got tired of waiting and did their own thing. I find a little bit of sanity in knowing that Middle Eastern people do it too. But they got tired of waiting. So they literally said these words. They went to Moses' brother Aaron and said, Aaron, we know that you can make things. And we know that Moses put you in charge while he's gone. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to make us some gods so that we can ask them to tell us what to do. I want to make a God that's going to instruct my life. <laughs> now, we can read that and see just how stupid that is. But I think there's so many times in Scripture that God wants me to see stupid right in front of me so that when I look in the mirror, I can recognize stupid. <laughs> Have you ever looked in the mirror and saw stupid? Yeah. Boy, if you haven't. <laughs> you're... We are the image of God. And so being in his image, God says, I want you to portray me and how I see you. Did you know that in the New Testament, the scripture has one place where it actually says that you are his masterpiece? Put the image of that in your mind. We don't know what to do with that passage, do we? We really don't. We can look at somebody else and see them as a masterpiece, and we look at our own life and we go, man, I'm not that. But God says you are. So are we capturing that image and correctly conveying it, or are we brutalizing ourselves many times, and God's saying you're his masterpiece, and we're saying, no, we're his trash piece. The image can't be different than the one God is conveying. And while Moses was gone, they created a different image. And that image did not portray or convey the ways and the words and the will of God. So go to the next slide with me that starts out with the question, what was different about Moses? So what, what was it was different? 
Well, the first thing we need to stop and bring into context here is that in this situation, Moses was the only one in the whole nation that was devout to follow God. Now, one of the things that you and I are dealing with in our culture today is that we're actually realizing that fewer and fewer people in our nation want to follow God. The American church as a whole is shrinking. It's not growing. Now, your church is an anomaly, meaning your church is actually out of ordinary because your church is healthy and it's thriving. It's not perfect. If you're looking for the perf perfect church, it's down this street, and it's called the First Church South of God. And the pastor speaks from the first book of opinions. <laughs> Meaning it doesn't exist. What you and I are supposed to do together is capture the image of God and then convey that image of God into each other, letting them speak the image of God into our own lives, and then also conveying that to people in our communities that don't yet know Christ and Lifeline Church, no matter what name it has going by that uh, year, um, is still the same church that is about giving away the gospel of Jesus. So those of you that have been here for a long time, don't worry about and get caught up with what name it is. The real name is following this one who owns the throne and owns the table and inviting people to worship at one and sit at the other. Man, I got to write that down. That was good. Okay, what was different about Moses? What did a whole generation of God's people, how did a whole generation of God's people get off track so easily and Moses did not? What can we learn from Moses' life that can help us today? Well, I'm going to cut straight to the chase here and say that there's three things. These are the three mottos that Lori and I have chosen to live our life by. If we were going to drive a stake in the ground, and anchor ourselves to a philosophy of life, it really comes down to these three words. The first one is gratitude. Grateful. The second one is humble. And the third one is hungry. And they're not in any particular order. It's, it's, it's a trifecta. If you don't have all three, it's like a triangle. If you tick off one of the corners, you don't have a triangle anymore. All three of these are necessary. And when you look in Moses' life, you will see a man who was grateful for everything that God had delivered them from. What has God already delivered you from? What has he already delivered you from? Did you know that in the scriptures... They were supposed to go camping. God's people were supposed to go camping, live in tents for two weeks every single year. Every single year, go camping and live in tents. The Meyer family knows all about doing that, <laughs> even if there are bears. For two weeks, not for two days, two weeks, and not once in their lifetime, every single year. And they had a job, a specific assignment that they were supposed to uh, attest to and justify their obedience to. And you know what that was? It was to capture an image and convey an image. It was all about imagination. So while they were in those tents, they were supposed to talk about the things that Yahweh had already done for them. Folks, the enemy is going to try to tell you that your story is tired and your story is old and your story is irrelevant. And that is a pitiful lie. Don't ever stop telling your story. And don't ever get so clean that your story is something that you see as something that you need to be ashamed of. Or like, you know, that was a different person. Absolutely. But you know, who championed that more than anybody was Paul. Paul would tell people, I'm the least worthy to ever even be called an apostle of God. And then he would tell his story again. And then later in Paul's life, he goes to court. And while he's in court, he wanted to convey an image. So he conveyed the image of what had captured him. And he kept telling the story over and over about being captured by God, literally, 
And then conveying that same image over and over and over. And their assignment, the Israelite people, the people of God, the Hebrew people, were supposed to live in these tents. And for two straight weeks, they were supposed to tell these stories over and over and over about what Yahweh had already done for them. And you know what that does inside yourself and in other people? Is you go back and you start assessing what really matters in life. And you also recognize what all God has already done for you. And you know what that does? It positively and significantly impacts your faith for the future. Because once you have taken yourself to court, so to speak, meaning you've gone back and reminded yourself and someone else the dialogue of all that God has done for you, and then you start looking at what you might face or that you are facing, and it starts to get ridiculous because you start realizing, wait a minute, the God who's done all of that, why would he not show up now? Now, he might not do it the way I want him to do it, and he might not do it in the time that I want him to do it. But by the time the next chapter is over with and we start the third chapter, we're going to look back at chapter two and say, you know what? Chapter one turned out to be pretty accurate. That God is still there, he's still working, and he's still doing marvelous things in my life. Secondly, is humble. What helps you and I stay humble? I would say it's the first one. Gratitude. When we realize everything he's already done for us, it's incredible how the most ridiculous thing we can do is get puffed up for pride as if we're the one that did it. Uh, 1 Corinthians, it's either 1st or 2nd Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 7. Somebody can look it up. I memorized it years ago as a kid in the King James, so it sounds ridiculous when you say it now. So here goes. What makes thee differ from another? What hast thou received, or what, what hast thou that thou hast not received? Now, if thou hast received it, why does thou glory as if thou hast not received it? You know what that really means? You didn't do jack. God did it. <laughs> In the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus said it this way. I'm the vine. You're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. When we keep that in mind, not only does the gratitude help us get to that point, but keeping in mind that we are nothing without Jesus makes it fascinating. So I've got, a, I've got a fun one that I want to show you. Fellas, if you would, skip to the one that says Moses spent 40 years. There you go. Moses spent 40 years in the king's palace thinking he was somebody. Then he spent 40 years in the wilderness finding out that without God, he was a nobody. Finally, he spent 40 more years discovering how a nobody with God can be a somebody. Anybody have that story? That's mine. When Moses and the people found out they were nobodies without the resources of God, that's when the exodus began. When the miracles began to take place and you're in my life again, if you've known Jesus for a while, you've seen patches where miracles are happening and then you've seen other patches that you feel like that the heavens are brats, as one scripture says. You've seen both. And the truth of the matter is, if we only saw miracles all the time, I think that would go take us back to not, not being grateful. It would take us back to ingratitude. Because we're, then we're like, if you never go through anything difficult, think about a kid that grows up and always gets everything they want immediately as soon as they want it. It, ca it causes instant gratitude. But delayed gratitude is actually one of the most important things that an adult can teach a minor. In fact, if you go online and study it out, they will show you all the psychoses that come out of an individual who was never taught delayed gratitude. Because there's something in us that is necessary for God to say, just sit still and listen. Well, but I... Sit still and listen. Yeah, but sit still and listen. 
If you're a parent and you've taught your children to do that, you've taught them one of the most powerful things they can do. It's sometimes they just sit still. I used to hate that. <laughs> How about you? My mom, sometimes she called it quiet time. Quiet time to me was the same as just being flat out in trouble. Because quiet time meant that we were supposed to go in our room and just be still. We could read, we could take a nap, we could do whatever, but we couldn't have the TV on and we couldn't be outside running around. It was called be still. And I had no idea what she was trying to teach us in that. I just thought, you know, this woman is crazy and she just is trying to take my fun away. But later on as an adult, I learned how important that was because it was delayed gratitude. Okay, I want to take you to the next slide now. Humility is not an abject, groveling, self-despising spirit. It is but a right estimate of ourselves as God sees us. Pride makes us artificial, and humility makes us real. Now check out this last one. It was pride that changed angels into devils. That's how the demons got to be demons. They listened to the wrong voices. Even angels can get caught up in social media. Even angels. And it, it takes us from capturing the image of God. And then somewhere in the middle of that, while we're coming down the hill, we want to adjust the writing of the tablets. And by the time we get down the hill, it's not the same. And some of the fallen angels convinced enough of the other angels that the Bible says that one-third of them, one-third of them. Folks, we still live in a day where popularity contests go on all the time for our attention. And I'm going to dare to say to you more than ever, this last Sunday, one of the elders at New Hope, uh, Kevin Wentworth, gave a prophetic word. It was a word that he came and shared with me last fall, and I had him share it this last Sunday, and last Sunday was our Vision Sunday. So for me to say, well, I'm not going to speak and talk about Vision for 2019 instead turned out to be that's exactly what Vision Sunday needed to be, was a healthy, healthy warning from the Holy Spirit that came in a word. And Kevin said that the Lord had told him that the things that we're seeing regarding wall or no wall the things that we're seeing regarding Republican or Democrat, the things we're seeing about who's president and who's governor and who's not, are going to increase for our time and attention as Christ followers. And that we are going to have to decide whose voice we're listening to. Are we going to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit? Are we going to listen to the captured image that has already been conveyed to us? Or are we going to listen to the social noise in our culture around us? Jesus says something that's kind of scary. And it shouldn't be scary if we are staying on course. And that's this. Jesus says that in the last days, the love of many would wax cold. What you're seeing is a proliferation of people that are finding excuses to fall out of the body of Christ all across the country because they're looking at the church and saying, you're not perfect. They're looking at pastors and leaders in the church and saying, you're not perfect. And here's the amazing thing. They haven't even taken the time to look in the mirror. They're expecting something of other people that they couldn't possibly live up to. What we need to be asking ourselves nowadays is not what church can do something for me, but like our famous president said in the early 60s, what can you do for your church? What can you do for your family? What can you do to be the image of God into someone else's life? I've lived by a model for a long time, and uh, all three of my kids up here in the front row can tell you that. It's a scripture, or not a scripture, but it's a saying that the Lord gave me that came from watching life happen, and here it is. Half of my healing comes from what I receive. The other half comes from what I give. You know what that's a depiction of? Grateful, 
humble, and hungry. Pastor Elliot. Give it up for this man of God right now. Come on. Thank you so much. Well, I don't know about y'all, but um, I- I'm, feeling a, I'm feeling it fresh in my heart. I'm feeling it fresh in my soul that I, I do so, so much. I want to be grateful. I want to be hungry. I want to be humble. And I know that some of us here today, we, we, that's exactly what we needed to hear. We need to get back on track. I know some of you here, you may, you may be here for the very first time. Maybe it's been a long time since you've been in church. And you heard something today that maybe this man spoke the words, but it was God that was speaking into your heart. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And we're going to do something that we do every single week. Don't let the music distract you too much. We do that just to help create an atmosphere for you to listen to the presence of God. Listen to God's voice in your heart. This is what I want to ask you. And this is what I want you to ask God, just in the quiet and still of this moment. You can ask it under your breath or just in your heart. Either way is fine. God, what are you speaking to me? God, what do you need us to hear today? God, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for speaking to your people. And I just know, I know that there are some of us here who are ready to take a step. There are some of us here ready to take that step and say, you know what, my my life isn't where I want it to be. Maybe you used to be close with the Lord. Maybe you used to be in close fellowship with him. You used to be praying and reading your Bible and in church, but somewhere along the way, that drifted. Somewhere along the way, maybe something happened to you. Maybe nothing happened at all. Life happened. But if that describes you, in just a moment, I'm going to give all of us an opportunity to say, God, I'm coming back to you. And for others of you, maybe you've never made that decision for yourself. You grew up going to church. Maybe you've never been to church in your life. Maybe your grandma has prayed this prayer for you. Maybe everyone else has wanted this for you, a relationship with Jesus. But for yourself, you have never said, Jesus, I want to be with you. I want to be walking with you. I want to give my life to you. Now, if I described you in any way, you used to know him, you used to be close with him, but you are not as close with him as you used to be and want to be. Or maybe you've never been close with him and you're ready to give your life to Jesus because God has been speaking to you throughout this service. If I described you at all, in just a moment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count to three, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to just to lift your hand. It's not because I want to see your hand. It's not because anybody's looking around wants to see you. Really, you're saying yes to God. You're saying, God, here I am. I'm I'm coming to you. I want to give you the controls of my life. And if that's you, go ahead and just lift your hand. One, two, three. God, I'm here for you. Go ahead. Be bold. I'm here for you, God. Yes, I see your hand. Yes, I see your hand. God sees you. And you know what? God is going to honor that decision made today. So let's all pray just out loud. Let's all pray this prayer together. Father God, I give you my heart. Thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for my sins. I give you my life. Fill me with your spirit. Make me new. Direct my path. I give you my past. I give you my right now. And I give you my future. Take control. Come on, let me hear a good amen in this place today. Can we just praise God for those that said yes to the Lord today? Amen, amen.